I'm Tony Hendra. And I'm Jeff Chrysler. And this is the final edition Radio Hour. 30 minutes of sizzling satire with teeth. Now let's turn to the dramatic New York mayoral race. Dramatic developments today as Representative Anthony Weiner, who resigned from Congress only two years ago after a dramatic nationwide sexting scandal, gained dramatically in the polls against frontrunner City Council President Christine Quinn. Our stone peck has the dramatic story. Less than two weeks after Representative Anthony Weiner officially declared he was a candidate in New York's Democratic mayoral primary, another challenger has entered the race, his own penis. His penis made the announcement at a press conference in the Waldorf Astoria. I'm proud to be standing before you today, flanked by my two beautiful testicles. It's time to cut out the middleman. And by middleman, I mean the man I'm in the middle of. The man to whom I'm attached at this very moment. Mr. Uh, Genitalia? Oh, enough of that fancy schmancy Latin crap. Call me Dick. Just Dick. Plain old Dick. Dick Sixpack. A nice looking, totally approachable Dick hole. Stand up for the little guy. Uh, Okay, Dick. How will your policies differ from Mayor Bloomberg's? Well, if elected, I will be the first actual congressional member to become mayor of this great city. Mr. Dick, Mr. Dick. Yes, little lady? Surely you won't be the first. Ed Koch served several terms in Congress before becoming mayor. Ed Koch was not a penis. He just looked like a penis. I am the genuine article, a real live sex organ with a mind of its own. Who'll stand up for the little guy? Fine, but what will your political agenda be? Once I am in Gracie Mansion, I pledge to stop with the legislative crap and spend all my time striving to become erect and then seeking release. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, kaboom! Whoa! That's disgusting. What do you expect? I'm a penis. Representative Weiner, how do you feel about your penis's challenge? I don't know. I mean, what can I... Ah! Ah! Good God. Weiner's penis has just dragged him off stage in the general direction of a young CNN intern. What you think of that, babe? <laughs> Paul Begala. I see this candidate having great populist appeal, kind of like Joe the Plumber, but more focused. I think Joe Sixpack could go for Dick Sixpack big time. How about Jill Sixpack? Get off of me, you animal! I think that's a real possibility, given time. The final edition presents a public service message from the National Denier Service. Here at the NDS, we've been getting calls about Billy Joel's depression. Was it caused by 9-11, as he said? The fact is, we just don't know enough about depression to say for sure. Although we do know that most people affected by 9-11 didn't drive their car through their neighbor's living room three times, it's possible that Billy Joel's depression was caused by listening to his last four albums, or simply by being Billy Joel. We've also gotten calls about the Jersey Shore. Is it foolhardy to rebuild boardwalks, beach homes, and other seafront infrastructure when another Sandy could hit the shore two months from now? Here at the National Denier Service, we have two sayings. One, this is now. That's two months from now. And two, Who cares about New Jersey? Here at the NDS, we know the whole state has been in denial ever since Bruce Springsteen started singing those terrible Tom Joad songs. One day, Chris Christie is the Koch brothers' puppet. The next, a hurricane hits and he asks the president for money. This makes him worthy of being president? This makes him worthy of an episode of King of Queens, which is off the air and not even set in New Jersey. We have our hands full at the NDS, not only denying that the Jersey Shore won't get a worse reaming than whatever they did to Chris Christie's stomach, but also denying that New Jersey is a place you should visit, let alone live, in the first place. 
The preceding announcement was paid for by Americans for Chris Christie's stomach. Senator McCain of Arizona paid a visit to Syria last week, despite the fact that he is still not commander-in-chief, and that Syrian rebels are reliably reported to be eating the internal organs of enemy soldiers they kill. Senator McCain, it is an honor that you visit our poor war-torn country. Well, uh, Abdul, if we can just get our yellow-bellied president to take action, we'll put a stop to all that real soon. Fantastic, Senator. Perhaps you will do me the further honor of joining my humble meal. Okay, Johnny, don't blow this now. We make nice with these fellas, get rid of Assad, Syria's taken over by the rebels, just like Libya. We open a new embassy in Damascus, cut funding for embassy security to nothing, Al-Qaeda terrorists take over the embassy, kill a few State Department lefties, Obama's impeached, Hillary's discredited, you run for President 16 and this time you win! These guys are your ticket to the White House. Senator, how about a nice juicy piece of lung? <laughs> Pretty darn. Rare. We don't waste fuel on this swine. Come on, Johnny. This is your last chance. Whatever you do, don't hurl. You're listening to the Final Edition Radio Hour. WBEZ, Chicago. Welcome to This American Life. I'm Ira Glass. As you know, each week we choose a theme, and this week the theme is annoying. As in, is this American life annoying? Or am I, Ira Glass, host of This American Life, annoying? Or, to get more to the point, is it my voice? Is my voice, along with all the other voices of the contributors to This American Life, annoying? Nancy Updike reports. It's a question that has plagued the most easily irritated ears that are too lazy to change the station right after, wait, wait, don't tell me. But why? Why are they driven to figurative insanity by our show? What is it about TAL that makes people slam off their car radios and angrily wait it out for a Prairie Home Companion? Or listen irritated to our podcast on their iPod, thinking out loud, why am I not listening to Fresh Air? Or they place comments on our webpage, blog about how much they hate us, or even worse, use Twitter. Uh, I, I shiver at the thought. Indeed. So why? Is it because on pledge drives we sometimes say T-A-L instead of This American Life? No, that's not why. And the answer may surprise you. Well, I'm excited to know, Nancy. Um, so it isn't my half-committed droning nasal tones? A very good guess, Ira, but no. No, it is not. It is our audience. Our audience? Fascinating. What makes this American life so annoying is that whatever we say, and I mean whatever we say, as long as it's in a soft, comforting voice, our listeners will claim it's the best thing they've ever heard, and whoever doesn't listen to our program is simply uneducated, uncultured, and inferior. Essentially, we are the New England educated liberal version of Rush Limbaugh. Explain. We did a piece once on a woman who was addicted to TV celebrity painter Bob Ross's voice. We did an entire segment on how this woman was addicted to soothing voices. Yes, it was compelling. But all the point was is that she likes soothing voices. Yes. Ira, everyone likes soothing voices. That's why people speak in soothing voices. And our audience now feels superior because they listen to a program about soothing voices. And that's not all. 
If someone is considered a comedian... Not a comic? Of course not. A comedian on our program is deemed always hysterical, and every word will be considered golden. Listen to our latest live show where Mike Burbiglia tells us a story about drinking a glass of water. I went looking for a glass. <laughs> when I found it, I poured the water into the glass. <laughs> and I drank the water. Here's another live show where David Sedera simply tells us his grocery list. French rolls, <laughs> butter, <laughs> olive oil, <laughs> kale. Wow. Amazing. I, I never knew our audience was so annoying. They're like Dane Cook's audience if they all went to Smith. I know. And here's one where our audience is amazed that Sarah Vowell actually played an instrument in her high school marching band like millions of other people who played an instrument in their high school marching band. So, I decided I would join the high school band. And I played a musical instrument. I am flabbergasted. Never mind whenever we have Joss Wheaton on. He can talk about the texture of paper for an hour and every one of our listeners will orgasm from their brain, feeling superior to anyone who doesn't have a tote bag. Great work, Nancy. I'm so relieved it's them and not how we've been speaking for the past 20 years. Join us next week where the show will be entirely about buttered toast and the theme, alienation. This has been This American Life. Give us money. Recently, at the Cannes Film Festival, 87-year-old comedian Jerry Lewis made a statement saying that he had no favorite female comedians because women aren't funny. Quote, I have trouble watching a would-be mother diminish her qualities to the lowest common denominator, says Mr. Lewis, whose most notable characters are arguably borderline retarded. Our own Strong Powers reports. Mr. Lewis, I'm glad you had the moxie to bring up such a fresh and intelligent topic. In my opinion, the question, are women funny, hasn't been discussed nearly enough by media outlets, entertainment sources, and comedy blogs in the last decade. Now... You've made some people, probably women on their periods, pretty angry by saying that watching women comics bothers you because half the population is simply incapable of humor. As an expert in comedy, how would you defend this statement? I know you can't tell because this is radio, but I'm wearing giant oversized teeth and I had my eyes crossed the entire time you were talking. <laughs> Classic. But seriously, Strong, it's just that I have too much respect for broads. Excuse me, chicks. To see them debase themselves by doing comedy. Same goes for cripples and ethnics. A charitable man indeed. You simply don't want women making fools of themselves. Right? Leave that to me! <laughs> Mr. Lewis had an unlikely supporter in the form of one Miss Tina Fey. No, he is absolutely correct. I am a woman and I'm not funny. I'm not really sure how I keep getting television, movie, and book deals. It's just one of life's little mysteries, you know? Like where babies come from or how milk is made. Even former U.S. Representative for Missouri's 2nd Congressional District, Todd Aiken, came to Jerry's defense. It seems to me, from what I know of comedy and what I've heard from doctors, if it's, quote, legitimately funny... The female body has ways of shutting the whole thing down. It has something to do with the uterus, I think. I mean, it's simple science, really. 
Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm late. I'm being anointed with sacred oils and chanted over this afternoon in order to ward off the nose demons who cursed me with this sinus infection. Well, there you have it, folks. When asked the question, are women funny? The answer is a resounding no. And no talent comedy freeloaders like Imogene Coca, Lucille Ball, Carol Burnett, Lily Tomlin, Gilda Radner, Madeline Kahn, Tina Fey, and hundreds of others and their fans just need to get over it and face the facts. Strong Power is reporting. The Final Edition's correspondent Stone Peck has a special report from Capitol Hill. Stone, what's going on? In the interest of the public welfare, I tried to visit Congress and report on it firsthand rather than just pick up stories from the wire service the way I usually do. And evidently, about two years ago, the U.S. Congress was replaced with a pet store. What do you mean a pet store? Dog food, cat toys, parakeets, puppies in the window. Well, well, do any of the puppies look like House Speaker John Boehner? I'll check. No, none of them. Maybe it's the wrong address? Well, no, it's the Capitol Dome. You can't miss it. This is Mr. George Constantine, the pet shop owner. Mr. Constantine, this is the old Capitol building, right? Yeah, I found it abandoned in 2011. I moved right in. Mitch McConnell had already stripped all the copper wiring. Uh, Okay, Stone, Stone, then how can we still get stories about Congress? Well, there's stories, but nothing actually changes. Apparently, a Senate staffer has been sending out press releases from God knows where. And the papers didn't try to confirm them? A couple of the bigger ones called an answering service for a quote, but mostly they just printed whatever they got. Should... should we be concerned that we don't have a Congress? I don't know, probably. A couple of bridges have fallen down, nobody's doing anything about it. Well, did you talk to any members of Congress about this? I called the answering service, but they just sent me another press release. Let's see. It says Republicans are holding another vote to end Obamacare. Wow! They're not even writing new stories. They've used this one like 30 times. The Final Edition Radio Hour's senior correspondent, Stone Peck, reporting from Constantine Pets and Supplies on Capitol Hill. And now, the Final Edition is pleased to present a public service announcement. As a throat cancer survivor, I know we must fight the myths about the HPV virus. Hi, I'm Michael Douglas. You may know me as HBO's Liberace. Perhaps, like my doctor, you believe throat cancer is caused by smoking or drinking. Wrong. It's caused by eating. Eating a tuna taco with the little man in the boat, if you receive my meaning. But whether you call it trimming the hedges, French kissing Mr. Lincoln, or lip-syncing to the fish fuel jukebox, cunnilingus is the biggest threat facing a 68-year-old actor today. Take it from a guy who's licked more than his share of box lunch anchovies. Just how many rugs do you have to munch? It only takes one. Although in my case, I think I munched 32,846. I stopped counting after the China syndrome. So before you part the Red Sea, Think about whether you really want to go way down south in Dixie. True, my bearded clam-based pathogen is helping me get non-homosexual roles again, but for an ordinary hair pie diner, it could kill you. So think before you dive, because a muff is a terrible thing to eat. Paid for by the people who believe Michael Douglas. A group of millennials, mostly male, mostly in t-shirts, came together last week in a dark East Village bar to celebrate the Society of Glass Enthusiasts, or SOGI, a loose affiliation of New York-area tech lovers who are self-proclaimed, quote, explorers, pioneers, and fans, unquote, of Google Glass. Our Pepper Lewis went along to check out the action. Seth Delord has tried Google Glass for five days, but he doesn't think the device goes far enough. Seth, what's the problem? Well, thanks to glass, I have a screen I can speak to suspended in front of my right eye, right? But I am H.O. Google should supplement Google Glass with mind-reading sensors that would give it direct access to my innermost thoughts. But that would give Google direct access to your innermost thoughts. Yes. 
I could control things with my mind without having to say anything or reach up to tap my Google Glass and, and, and look silly. Then we'd all become androids. Oh, wow, that's yeah. really cool. I so think we'd all be Google androids. Yes, we have total faith in Google's vision and the world Glass aims to create. Tethering technology seamlessly to everything we humans do. In effect, fusing its algorithms with our brains. And that's a good thing? Um, Laura? Yes. We don't actually have Google Glass because it's not widely available yet. But our community banded together for no other reason than to celebrate an unfinished, unreleased product that's very expensive and strange looking and to be Google Glass ambassadors and defend Glass against the kinds of horrible press that television and radio and the phonograph got before they were widely accepted. So you guys are just doing this because you love Google so much? Yeah. 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 It's like the greatest company ever. Duh. Well, I'm a professional fangirl. I've been involved with fan groups for Harry Potter, Doctor Who, The Hunger Games, Steampunk, and many others. Oh, by professional, do you mean Google's paying you? No. Our fan group isn't affiliated with Google, but we already have more than 10 regional chapters around the world and over 800 online members. How do you communicate with them, er, Mal? Through Google+. Plus. I'm a sophomore at NYU. What I can't wait for is the day when Google Glass will be able to answer questions as quickly as I can think them up. I mean, as information becomes so available to you, what's the point of learning anything? No question, glass can transform life as we know it. But can we convince people to wear an all-seeing head-mounted camera that records everything? Um, Kyle, a bar in Seattle recently banned glass wearers for that very reason. Oh, that no was, way! Because they're a bunch of morons. Now that is they're unconstitutional. Morons. Seth, you're the only actual glass owner in the group. Does wearing it make you self-conscious in public? Yeah, a bit. And in the subway, I worry about someone grabbing it off my face. You need ear loops on it or something. What we really need is even smaller, more camouflaged computers. Then you could have digitized contact lenses. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Great that. idea. Or you can implant microchips in the skin around your eyes. Oh, oh my God. God. Yeah. But guys, have you considered that these devices, including Google Glass itself, are two-way, allowing a huge multi-billion dollar for-profit global corporation to control what you're seeing and hearing and providing all the information you access and eventually knowing everything you're thinking? Is that a good thing? Absolutely fantastic. Just think what life would be like in a Google techno utopia. Where Larry Page and Sergey Brin would call all the shots and no recording device of any kind would be banned. Google Island Beta. Yeah! yeah! If Google became a country, wouldn't you join it? Would I have to move? I'd move. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, me too. Why not? Yeah. How can I turn really sign up? I'd probably do that. Google is my master. I'll tell you right now, for me, I'd sign away any citizenship I ever had. I'd be like, done. With the exception of Pepper Lewis, who is a fictional The Final Edition radio show character, the preceding scene actually took place in an East Village bar in late May and was reported by Bianca Bosca of the Huffington Post. The Final Edition edited the piece for length, but the dialogue is either verbatim or adapted directly from Bosca's narrative. All other names have been changed to protect the idiots. Satire is dead. This portion of the Final Edition Radio Hour is brought to you by mayoral candidate Dick, formerly known as Anthony Weiner's Penis. Vote for Dick in the September mayoral primary. Dick, a nice-looking, really approachable sex organ who will stand up for the little guy. And gal. This is Dick, and I am real this person. This episode of the Final Edition Radio Hour was performed by Darby Worley, Barry Lank, John Marshall, Kevin Janis, Rob Gordon, Jen Dodd, Jeff Chrysler, and Tony Hendra. It was written by Barry Lank, John Marshall, Rob Gordon, Jen Dodd, and Tony Hendra. When you're online doing whatever it is you do online, we don't really want to know. 
All we ask is you visit thefinaledition.com for more sizzling satire with teeth. The Final Edition Radio Hour was produced by Jeff Chrysler and Tony Hendra and edited and engineered by Greg Russ. The Final Edition Radio Hour is a production of The Final Edition, LLC, copyright 2013.